Welcome to Rocketship, the home of epic React Native content. I'm Simon Grimm, creator of Galaxies.dev, and today's guest is Evan Bacon, the creator of Expo Router. Thanks for joining me, Evan. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Simon. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's so awesome to finally have you. I've used Expo Router so many times, and I have so many questions. I'm pretty sure the community has a lot of questions as well. Before we get into a huge discussion uh, about Expo Router, I just want to uh, quickly introduce a bit more about you. So you are currently the engineering manager of developer tools at Expo. Uh, and you've been with Expo actually since 2017. So you must be like one of the the, the first when it was still called Exponent back then. Is that right? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Around around the time it was renamed from exponent to expo it's, it's when i when i joined the team but it's changed a lot since then uh, it used <laughs> to be it used to be very centered around the the app that you download and you would like publish and and share apps through that that spirit system so i was using expo for for work and uh, in my spare time just because i love using it so much i would like publish apps and then the team would like see them and use them and and then when I joined, I was like, all right, let's, um, <laughs> well, let's, let's just app development, I think, uh, make like the best way to build production apps. And, and I think we're, you know, we're right there. So now we're, we're working on new stuff. So, so the interesting thing about you that people probably don't know who haven't checked you out is that you're actually an, an artist and technologist. So I do have some of the stuff you've built in the background as well, people looking at my stuff. So I'm, I'm a big fan of Legos besides their steep price. Uh, but it looks like you, you've been an even bigger fan. I think you, like, you, you, you did it kind of like a professional building huge Lego blocks in the past. Yeah. Um, so when I was, uh, let's see, maybe 12 to 18 or 19, I, I would make these large life-size Lego sculptures and, um, and sell them like as artwork to people uh, and just take them around and like show them off, uh, which is great. I love <laughs> is that very, I love articulate projects. Very, you know, they take a long time, um, but it was difficult to show them off to a lot of people. Like if you wanted to experience one of these, you could maybe see them on the internet mm -hmm. and like video sharing, <laughs> you know, picture and video sharing was okay back then, but it's not like what it is now. Uh, like we used to, have to post them on like <laughs> PHP based like forms and stuff. So if you really wanted to see them, you had to come in real life and view them and uh, they're Lego. So you would, you would have to live in the greater Texas area or go really great distance. So. I, I love people... open source because you can just share it instantly with people. Right, people should definitely check it out. It, it looks looks really really epic. And besides that, uh, I think it's interesting. Like you, like people have this tendency. So you're like a builder from from ground up. And I always had like when I was younger, I made these window color paintings and I sold them to my family when we had like birthdays. So I always had this like I want to make my own stuff and sell it. And, and now I'm I'm here like selling online courses. So yeah, it, it's like foreshadowing what we later do in life. I, I sometimes feel. Um, but you, you, you gladly transitioned from Legos to real technology. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> before we get into router, I want to just uh, start with a quick adventure into game development, because I think those were like your your initial roots. If we go to your blog, I will link to this uh, below. It's, well, I believe it's just evanbacon.dev. There are some games. So did you get started back then with game development? And, and what are uh, the tools? So did you already use React Native for these games back then? Yeah, so all the games on evanbacon.dev uh, are Universal Expo apps. Uh, I did make some other games originally with um, Swift and Objective-C. And the way that came about was just in the Lego space, it, it really overlapped a lot with the gaming space. So I'd go to like conferences and, and show off these sculptures. And um, it, the, Austin just has a huge uh, gaming presence. Hmm. So people always pointed out that like, oh, maybe you'd be you know, pretty good at software development. And I was like, nah, I'm going to do Legos forever. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and they were they were completely right. Um, and I don't know, it was just like if you're a kid and you're trying to get into software development, gaming is such an excellent way to do it. You like, you know, really good responsive feedback, and you can see something that you can play with that you can show your friends. They can enjoy. You can also be offline first, and really like, you, you can you know derive a lot of satisfaction from that, right? If you want to build something like. Um, I don't know. It's like, imagine trying to get a 16 or 17 year old excited about coding. It's like a notes building app that works <laughs> offline. And like, maybe like I already have one of the, you know, the bar is high. Um, 
but I don't know. It's a little different now because we have like fast refresh and we have really great front end tools. Mm -hmm. So I could see people being pretty compelled by just, you know, react as it is today. Yeah, I, I actually, when I was at that age, I also wanted to become a game developer until uh, at some point I learned what game developers earn and how much they have to work and that it's like uh, not actually their best job. So <laughs> I decided, well, let's let's probably just study this whole software development thing first and then figure it out. Um, but but you're crossy platform. So this is like the, the <laughs> yeah. this is like the best like. There's a game, I think, uh, is it called Cross Crossroads? Cross, Crossy? There is a, a game called Crossy Road, yes. Um, and this it, is a, a clone of that game. And when I originally, how? Yeah, when I originally built it, it, it's all in 3JS. And it just, I think, speaks to just how great the, the JavaScript ecosystem is that you can, yes. with basic primitives, just build something like, like Crossy Road. And it only took me, um, it was like one sit down, so a couple hours to build. And, Sorry? Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I built it all originally with Expo. So it wasn't even built on the web. This was entirely an Expo GL you know, back in the early days of Expo. It was one of the first things I built with Expo. And um, I was just blown away because I was always a, like an, I was an iOS developer. I got started with Objective-C and it just took so long to build things. And I think this is really just uh, it speaks to what it means to like go from trying to be productive without hot module reloading and fast refresh and then mm -hmm. switching and having these tools. And it's like, You, you just be like addicted to how fast it updates and how much you can do and how quickly you can move. It is still to this day mind blowing to me that native developers don't have these tools. Like uh, even if we talk about other frameworks, Flutter, Capacitor, Cordova, Ionic, uh, React Native, like everyone these days has in some sort hot reload, live reload. And then you go to iOS and you're like, redeploy to simulator, stop redeploy, redeploy. Like, why can't they figure this out? Can't they make this any better? This is such a huge, like, huge developer experience improvement. Yeah, they, they, they talk about it a little bit. They have Swift, Swift UI previews or something, but they, they rarely work. They, they break down very frequently. Like, with uh, Expo, you can, there's a config plugin that I've been, I just built in my spare time. It uh, <laughs> allows you to add, like, Apple targets. So one mm -hmm. is, like, a widget, and it will, like, link just the code for that target in a, a folder outside of the iOS directory. But the way you would de develop that is with Swift UI. So you can go in and then just with that single file or however few files are in there, you know, work with those and use their, their HMR. But I find it just, I don't know, it breaks down really frequently and it's too, the, the compiler system is a little too opaque. It's very difficult to make sense of what goes wrong and like why it stops working, which I think is the problem. In many cases, like the, the best way to make tools faster is to just take a, like a slow tool and understand why it's slow. You know, like mm -hmm. add all of the logs that show here's what, what happened and like here's the process of breakdowns, here's when a cache hit or miss. And if you do that, then it's, it becomes obvious to basically anyone uh, how to speed that tool up. And if you don't have that, then it's like usually people, their mind goes to like, how do we start from scratch and add that? I don't think they have anything to get, like, yeah, maybe the, the Swift UI stuff, but beyond that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's nothing really great they can use, which is a yeah, pity. Yeah, sorry, I digress. <laughs> Talking about compilers. <laughs> yeah, <this> is uh, <laughs> I also need to close the, the game section of, you're like, it's playing the crossy platform jingle in infinite loop, and I'm just still <laughs> so blown away that it's just 3JS, and you basically just... Yeah, created this in a few couple of hours. I mean, did you also create the assets in a couple of hours, or did you have something for that? Yeah, there's like a voxel program I used to create the the assets, and it's pretty pretty. And also, it's voxels. So it's I had pre past experience with this, like uh, making okay. cube based art. <laughs> um, but yeah, when I originally made it, I posted it, and I was I was really excited. So I tweeted at the Cross Hero team, and then maybe like an hour or two later, they sent me a like a takedown notice. They were like, hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> so now it's called Crossy Platform, which a nod to the fact that it runs everywhere. Wasn't that like Flappy Bird or something was also taken down and then there were like a lot of clone applications? Yeah, yeah. I think the, the official uh, guy took yeah. Flappy Bird down. Um. <laughs> oh, these were so good. The good old days of good iOS apps, like the all these apps now are just like concepts over and over again. It's it's always the Clash of Clans concept and Clash of Clans just does it best. But... I mean, there are some good games. The games I play, Leap Day, have you played this? It's incredible. 
And Leap re- Day. Yeah, Leap Day is pretty great, and Redungeon. Those are those are my two go tos right now. Oh, I will have to check these out. I will Leap Day. Uh, what is it about? Um, oh, that looks good. It's just super oh. basic. Yeah, it's it's a simple game, but it's like you jumping around. Yeah, like very with a super meat boy. Um, yeah, exactly nice. like that. Yeah. <laughs> I still I still remember when we were in university and my I was living together with a with a friend from school and uh, one night he was playing this super meat boy game and he was screaming so loud when we <laughs> failed again in a level like the next morning someone from upstairs was saying could you please be a bit more silent next time I'm learning for something. we're like sorry <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> Wild. <laughs> uh, yeah, wild, wild wild playing times. But today uh, we want to also talk now about Expo Router. Of course. Uh, some, some serious stuff, of course. Mm-hmm. So um, when this episode goes live, Expo Router version 3 with Expo SDK 50 is already a few years, uh, a few weeks mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, on the market. First of all, let's start really basic for people who still haven't really used Expo Router or who haven't heard about the whole thing because they didn't look at Twitter the last two years. What is Expo Router? Yeah, Expo Router is uh, the first file-based router for native applications. And what this does is it, it basically unlocks the, the next step of universal code sharing. So. The idea here is what if things like HMR and bundling and uh, navigation routing, what, like a lot of these more complex meaty topics, what if those could be shared across web and native? But then also, you know, with classic native navigation, um, there's just a ton of boilerplate. You have to set up and instantiate all your views, your types, your deep linking. So with file-based routing, we figured out a way to um, do all of that automatically based on the files in your file system. Um, but still allow really complicated um, and expressive advanced layout patterns. So, you know, one that was really tricky to get the V1 out was um, the ability to have multiple tabs where you could present the same view in multiple tabs simultaneously, Mm -hmm. which you'll see on Twitter a lot. Maybe, like, you can open up uh, your profile in, like, the, the first tab and go to the second tab, search your profile, and then open your profile there. And so in both of those... Um, you would want the the URL kind of in, in the background or on web to be the same URL, but it would be presented in two different locations visually. So the file system needs a way to reflect that. There's just a, a lot of complications with native development, and native navigation that made um, made navigation seem like something that wouldn't work with file file based routing. Um, and we, we've solved a lot of those. So now we're working on. Um, Solving solving some some more difficult uh, problems, which we uh, we'll get into, I guess, here in a little bit. Yes, definitely, we will get more into the current state and uh, what's coming in the future as well. So, the basics here, and the, the first thing you always uh, uh, not recommended, you always reminded me of, is that underneath Expo Router, there's actually still React Navigation. So, the package that people used for the last years and and love for. Uh, native drawer components for for tab bars. This is still under the hood of Expo Router, correct? Yeah, yeah. So it's entirely built on React Navigation, which is a library that uh, we we developed at Expo. Brent Vatney and, and Satya um, developed um, you know, basically the, the whole thing, and it was really important that we we could build on top of React Navigation. It wasn't super easy at the beginning, but I'm I'm really glad we we went this direction because uh, it just means we can leverage all of the innovation happening across tons and tons of different teams Um, because now you have anything related to native navigation from Software Mansion with React Native Screens, um, all the work of the React Navigation team, and uh, things like Gestures, Gesture Handler, Reanimated, all these you get a leverage whenever they come out, immediately available in Expo Router, um, which is really fantastic. And then also, I love that you can just drop down the config-based navigation if you so choose, because you're not locked in. I think that's something that the the Remix framework did really well with um, using React Router underneath. Yeah, it's it's really interesting, especially once you work more with Expo Router and you get, for example, into like configuring your stack or your tabs. You quickly notice that all these options you can look them up actually in the React Navigation documentation. You don't have to go to Expo Router. So everything that you used before the the header back title, the header shadows, the tab styling, 
like all the props are just the same. It's not like I have to completely uh, relearn something. But the one, one question I would have about this is, so of course on the web, all these URLs and routes totally make sense. So is Expo Router mm, the preferred choice if you want, or if you know that you also want to have a website built with your React Native project and do I actually still get benefits if I only want iOS and Android app, or could I just stick with React Navigation in that case? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, so v, V1 is all the features from each uh, major release kind of live horizontally next to each other because we're, we're waiting to, we have this full scope picture of what we want to deliver. And um, it's just a matter of time to build each set of features. So everything in V1 is still highly relevant today. Um, and all of the, the functionality that we delivered there, extremely beneficial to native developers. Uh, I think in my personal opinion, the most incredible feature of Expo Router is the automatic deep linking. I, just, I think that's gonna really be an, an important hallmark of, of app development in the future. Um, and you can even see like little hints at, at why and how in, uh, in the community, but uh, yeah, like you automatically get deep linking for all of your routes, which you can easily turn into universal linking, which means that any piece of content in your app, including the parameters, like the serializable properties that you set between uh, routes, all of that can be shared publicly with a URL, which is huge. It like um, Without this, the most compelling way to enter your app is through some other external means. For a lot of people who don't have these, that external means is just the home screen icon on your phone. Um, and it, it, that's not super compelling for a lot of home screen <laughs> icons. Um, so, you know, that's a really big feature. And then also automatic TypeScript is pretty sweet as well. We're still actively working on refining this. Um, but what this means is that as your project scales, um, you, you'll you get like type assertions based on if things no longer work as you would expect them. And I, this is also pretty neat because if you combine that with deep linking, you get some pretty interesting handles on functionality. So one that is, yeah, this is an interesting use case, but it's not a super interesting feature. And this is uh, quick actions, you know, where you like long press the home screen mm -hmm. and you get like those little options. Not a super important feature. Actually, I would argue it's really, really not important at all. And in most applications, adding it is just going to kind of hinder your ability to upgrade and move quickly. <laughs> Um, but with Expo, when you combine config plugins where you can just easily instantiate this and uh, typed routes and Expo Router, often what you can do is you can have these quick actions just go to a link inside of your app. And then if you combine that with typed routes, then you can basically type out what those links are. So if at any point, if you refactor stuff, you'll get a type assertion that your quick actions no longer work. Without this, mm -hmm. those are just kind of floating in the ether. And you would have to like manually remember to test those every time you change your navigation. And you start to see how like the, the tech debt builds up and builds up and builds up. Um, so one thing I really like about typed routes is that you have this ability to hook in externally with your app um, it, with features that you, you don't necessarily need to test end to end. <laughs> it's actually, it ties back to when people are, with TypeScript were like, you don't have to test your code, you have TypeScript, which is not true. <laughs> but in, in small doses, it's kind of, elements of it are true because people used to write tests that were like, if I pass a string to this function that expects an object, should it assert? And it's like, you don't really mm -hmm. have to write those tests anymore because the, the TypeScript is automatically testing that continuously. So with uh, type navigation, you, you are getting some element of that where certain aspects of testing are done automatically by simply existing. So I, I do think that there are a ton of benefits to um, native only application developers with Expo Router. And it's also just, um, I think it's really important that navigation is a built-in primitive to the framework. <laughs> like prior to Expo Router and people who today don't use Expo Router, they, they look at their app and they're like, all right, this is a, an empty canvas. And they will append navigation to that canvas. Whereas Expo Router users, um, you know, navigation routing is it's, it's just baked in. Like when you look mm. at the screen, you're looking at a screen that can be navigated to and from. Um, and you, you know that that routing is just always present. So um, I, I think that's incredibly important because so many apps have navigation. And we're, we're continuing to build it out. We're 
know, there's so many apps should have data fetching and they should have um, some sort of back end um, option integration. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we will get to back end integration as well. Uh, that's also a good point. <laughs> Sorry, I yeah, have to get ahead I'm, of myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm definitely a big fan of the type routes as well. So, for everyone who hasn't used this, Basically, whenever you have new files in your in your app folder and you create a link component with an href, it will automatically give you the drop down of like available routes. If you use a route uh, that doesn't exist, you're going to get an error. Um, these type routes are definitely helpful. And I've also worked with universal links um, at this point. Yeah. To be fair, uh, there's a lot involved with universal links in terms of like Apple and Android stuff that you need to <laughs> do. So this is not done by Expo, but um, from but that is a cool thing from the Expo side. It's like like two lines of code, and it just works. Like I can go everywhere in my app with a deep link, and it just works. Um, there, so there yeah. is a, a little a little Easter egg. I haven't talked about this publicly yet too much. Um, let me see if I can find what it what it's called. Uh, but I, I wrote a small CLI script which does set up a lot of the Apple stuff for you. Uh, it's MPX setup dash Safari. Um, so if you run this in your Expo app, then it will automatically uh, code sign the, your, your iOS app for universal linking. And then it will tell you what the meta tags are that you need to add to your HTML and what your Apple app set association should be and where that should go. So you can do all the code signing automatic. I just, it's not like this perfect, <laughs> the way I imagine it is, um, you know, if, if Explorator were more web first, then you would, you would always have that website and then we would be able to automatically provision and code sign based on if you had the app. Um, but mm -hmm. since it's currently more um, this native first thing and web is optional, the ability to do that universe is kind of out of step. So there is this this kind of temporary tool, and you can run it, and that does do a lot of the code signing for you. Um, but yeah, no, pro tip, give it a try. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> I'm going to put the link in the show notes as well, definitely. Um, and you already said before that you had a, like a scope of four versions for Expo Router. So currently we had the V3. Uh, maybe we can recap quickly what V1, V2 and we three currently are, and then we can after that also talk about what's still missing or what's coming in the future. Yeah, so V1, the idea was just prove that it is possible to make file-based <laughs> routing work on native. That, I mean, there's just forever people thought it wasn't. Um, I spoke with people when the RSC came out, they were like, yeah, it's not possible. Um, <laughs> V2 was, uh, it, was, it was really focused on building out the capabilities we needed in the bundler. So things that we released there were um, you know, a ton of web support, web features. We had static rendering for web, um, the ability to do like tons of build time, static generation, get SEO. We added the head component. That's where we added typed routes, um, CSS for web, um, you know, just a ton of functionality. Uh, I would, if people haven't uh, seen the V2, I would highly recommend looking through that. And then V3, which we just released, has API routes. It fully introduces the new server platform, or rather the, the web, the server variation of the web platform, and, um, and then a, a number of other really great improvements. But the, the, the key features here have been roll out native, roll out web, roll out the server. And then in V4, we, we really tie them all together. We add, uh, the, the plan is to add the server variations of each platform. And, um, and basically just make sure everything is fully universal. There's a little bit of forking right now in V2 and V3 where there are functionalities that exist only on certain platforms, uh, namely the web. And with V4, the plan is to bring all of these functionalities and a, a couple more to every platform. So you know, one thing that has just always been an issue with um, building universal apps. This is, you know, originally, if you think about the state of universal, you had like web, iOS, and Android. And then you had React Native and web. And then you had like a monorepo where you could share universal code inside of a web project and a React Native project. Mm -hmm. And now with Expo Router, you can, you can kind of move the state up a little bit. And the forking starts to happen at the layout route level, where you want your layout route to look one way on native and to look a different way on web. But everything else, all the bundling, all those techniques can be used everywhere. And there are still some really fundamental missing pieces on native like 
uh, it, it's, the, it's the things that you don't want to do multiple times. Those are the most important to get right. So this is going to be like your rendering patterns. You know, if you do build time static generation, like if code is uh, evaluated ahead of time before you deploy, that should be universal. Hmm. Server rendering, data fetching, um, handling authorization, you know, authenticated routes, stuff like that, all that should be uh, universal. And and then, you know, pieces like the text, like the view, the, the parts that you want to be like to work on, it's, I think, fine if those parts are less universal. Like you're motivated to work on them. Uh, you are not motivated to figure out how to make your bundles split <laughs> the same way across iOS, Android, and web. Um, so, yeah, the key is to really un make, unify as much of these these more difficult, challenging pieces that work behind the scenes um, as possible so that you never really have to think about them. And, and, and yeah, V4, hopefully we will deliver on. Um, it, it's, it's a really big scope. And the more we work on it, the more we understand how big the, the scope is getting there. Um, but, yeah, you, yeah. You, you had a very interesting um, quote in one of your recent articles that I also used in my video. We will come back to that when we talk about uh, a bit about Next.js and Expo in the end. Um, but for now, let's also quickly drill down into uh, Expo Router version 3 and what you just shared. So you said API routes. And I've shared this a couple of times. I think I kind of got the concept, but most people still reply with, API routes in my React Native project. What, what, why, and how? <laughs> could you could you explain how this works and and like why we need it? Yeah. Um, so the the how to, how this works is um, you know primarily Expo Router is a bundler integration, a bundler feature. Uh, historically, throughout the, the React Native space and just the whole Native space, we have focused very little on the build tools and the build pipeline. But if you look at the innovation that's happened in the web space, there's so little that you can actually do with the runtime because it's, it's shipped by the browser vendors that a lot of the innovation happens in, in the bundler and the build time you know, space. Um, so Expo Router is like, what if we did all of that for native? And API routes is a very natural next step for that because you... If you look at, uh, uh, there's so many reasons. My mind is racing right now. <laughs> um, you know, if you look at maybe a React Native project that had some sort of API routes, there were just so many like missing little language features. And that's one thing that we really wanted to nail with V2 was getting the the language features correct. So we added TS config paths, environment variables, um, and then you know various forms of mocking, um, fixing up the types. So if you imported like React Native Web, you would have the web types on it. There was just a lot of little, like, and it was death by a thousand cuts. Um, and so with API routes, it was like, what if we took the exact same bundling pipeline with all the same language features, and then we we allowed those to run in a, a server environment as well. So if you set up TS config paths once for your app, you get those same preferences in your, your API routes. And then we built it all on Winter CG and all the modern standards so that in the future, like you can uh, today deploy with workers, worker runtimes, things that run on the edge, um, as you would expect, and uh, and all that works. Um, so we're really just trying to make this as seamless as possible, and a lot of that will also make more sense with V4, like why we we chose to do that. You know, one hint of this is uh, with API routes today, you can actually use um, TSX and, and and JSX inside of your API routes, and, and that works you know perfectly. Like we will compile down. And we'll compile down in such a way where you do get component stacks and you get all the, the various React um, debugging features that you, you would want, even in a server environment. Are you saying we're moving here in the direction of React uh, server components? <laughs> yeah, we're definitely moving uh, towards server components. Um, it's a really exciting primitive for React Native. Like it's, it's super exciting in the context of React Native. In the context of web, it's it's a lot of complexity for functionality that you may have already been privy to. Um, for instance, with use client, that's a really great um, boundary for bundle splitting. And mm -hmm. on web, there's like tons of great ways to have boundaries for bundle splitting. And then there's also build time generation and um, streaming content. And like a lot of these kind of existed in many ways on web, but on native, they they just have never been there. So server components... You know, very excellent. The, the stuff that you can do with it is just extremely exciting. Um, we have a prototype that we use internally to, to test and play with server components and um, like in, in every platform, and it, it feels just like mind-blowing. 
Yeah, um, uh, I recently had uh, Shimon here on the podcast who did like a little talk about React Native or React Server components and how they could be used with React Native and uh, also talk with Theo about this. Um, I'm, I'm slowly getting used to adopting the concept because, yeah, we have over-the-air updates, which we can use with Expo to completely replace the app. But with RSC, we could probably just like have this little button or this one tab replaced instead of like replacing the whole JS bundle of my application. So, yeah, that's a great point. Like, uh, OTA updates are incredible. They are one of the best features that you can have in a native app today. Uh, they are just fantastic. And the way that they currently work is they are one giant JS bundle with basically one caching policy. It's a very aggressive caching policy, and it's designed to make sure that it doesn't feel like there are OTA updates there, and it replaces the whole app. And all assets are also included inside of this. So there is an upper limit on your assets. And just with that framing, it's like, all right, now if you wanted to take the best thing and make it better, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is probably add some more flexibility, add the ability to like split based on routes. I mean, you like figure out some way to load content. Maybe a lot of your content is offline, but content that does require data or it does require internet connection, maybe that content lives online with the data. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a very natural progression into, into server components. And it's not right for every app. It's not a silver bullet. It, it is especially right for apps that use the internet and have content. Um, and for apps like that, uh, they, they end up having to roll their own solution for this. Um, so in, you know, having one unified solution, which is just handles a lot of really difficult edge cases, like for instance, with server components, if you're rendering some content and you get to a component that has an error, then it will stream back the error data for that. So you can like <laughs> present, you know, like a unified error system inside of your application as well, which is what you want. Um, but when you're rolling all this yourself, you're you're ex just so excited that it works in any capacity that mm -hmm. you, you know you want to you don't want to touch it too much. Um, so yeah, it's, I'm, it's I'm definitely sweet. excited to see this in reality. I've seen some previews, um, and I saw that with V3 you added async routes, and you said that async routes represents an early preview of how we plan to support RSC. So that makes me really optimistic that RSCs are possible in 2024 with Expo and React Native? Yeah, it should definitely be something that people will be able to at least, there should be some sort of beta in 2024 uh, for every platform universal RSC. It, like this is the year for that. Uh, everything that we build in V1, V2, and V3 were absolutely required to get to, to full RSC. Um, there are variations. There, there's like technical edge cases where certain parts aren't required, but um, no, like uh, we, I, it, a lot of what I built with Expo Router actually in the beginning, there was a demo and I showed like how you could get RSC to work with React Native. It's on Twitter. And um, everything that was in that demo has now landed upstream as in, as in React in Expo Router. Um, but yeah, there's, there's still a, a number of other things that are re required. I'm, I'm, I'm very optimistic that Expo and your team can figure that out. So I want to come back to Expo Router and some um, practical tips later, because I think right now feels like a good point to look also to V4. We, we've talked now about V1, V2, V3. Uh, we've touched on RSC. Um, so what is your plan for V4? And also, before uh, hitting the record button, you also shared some some interesting <laughs> information regarding Expo Web with me. So maybe you can talk a bit more about um, so what V4 means, also in terms of the timeline, and then uh, what your thoughts are on, on Expo Web and what will happen uh, in the rest of this year. Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so the, the plan with V4 is is basically, can we add, uh, is data fetching? And uh, can we figure out like how to really tie the story of API routes and your client code together very neatly? So right now with API routes, um, you know, something that's really great about it is that you can just make fetch requests. You don't need like any sort of crazy data patterns. Everything is just hidden away and it's very invisible. You're just using web primitives to, to interact with, um, with your server and your client. So but, as, a, as a practical example, I can like make a call to the open AI uh, mm -hmm. API and I can have my 
secret keys hidden, not in my React Native application, but actually in that API route and securely on a server. And exactly. my app can fetch the data through that API route from OpenAI. Yeah, and I think this is this is really powerful for a kind of an indirect reason, and that is that there are so many SaaS tools, and people have seen these all over the place, that do incredible things. Um, and their their examples of how to use them will often be that that kind of you know one two punch of like here is your front end code, here is your your server code, and then it's actually a third punch, which here is your environment variables, and that that touches on all three of the the most important pieces there, and native just is not privy to that kind of that kind of setup, that kind of promotion or onboarding. And many of these tools can now go in and be like, here is how you you do this system with native. Um, here is how if you have an iOS app or an Android app, um, you can interact with our um, our SaaS in a secure way. You you actually you see this very frequently if you're a native developer with authentication, where someone will be like, here is how authentication works. Um, and then here is where your client secret is. Do not put this in the app, but make sure you use it. And then developers are like, where does it go if it doesn't go in the app? Like, all I have here mm -hmm. is the app. And it creates this kind of weird hidden space where web developers are much more, well, web developers, they, it's just like, all right, put that in your API route, make the request there, and then you're good to go. Um, so that, that disconnect, I think, really has blocked off a lot of um, important innovation. Like if authentication is one of the hardest parts of your app to build, or if it's even ranked, then you know, it's a pretty high barrier because authentication is just so requisite for many different types of applications. Mm -hmm. Basically everything where you, you want to sell some sort of service or storage or, or compute that doesn't live on your device. Um, and yeah, so with V4, can we tie that server client connection together even better than what, how we currently have it? Um, you can actually kind of see with Expo Router v1 through 3 just racing native through the um, the releases of innovation in the web. There's like web had this this many years ago and web had this this many years ago and this. <laughs> and you can see us like kind of pinging through all those points um, on, on a universal platform. Um, and yeah, so you can you can look to what modern web is doing today slash a little bit in the future and, and get a sense for what we're planning for v4. Um, v4 will have the last, you know, big set of major changes. Um, and then everything will be very iterative on top of that. So what the plan is, is to have all of the building blocks to build um, really anything that you can think of, um, and be just be unblocked by the team working on Expo router. And um, and then every release after that, for the most part, will be iterative, improving things, like speeding things up, um, reducing bundle size, improving code elimination, in improving the ergonomics all around. Um, but yeah, another really important aspect of V4 is when I first thought of what I wanted to do with Expo Router, um, and I was thinking about it for a while as I was building like pre-build and working on EAS build with, with Brent Vedney. Um, the, the scope of it was kind of scoped to V4. And so we've been building it in public, but when we get to V4, that it'll kind of reset and we will rename the framework to something else. And it will be basically like V1 of that new framework. And we will extract the elements of Expo, which are web related into this new framework and this new framework will be more um, kind of server first, and it, it'll still you'll still be able to do everything that you can do today, where you get all these benefits of native. Um, if you want those, all you do is just turn off the server features, which is much easier to do than it is to add them, right? Like if you you want to turn off mm -hmm. bundle splitting, all you do is turn off bundle splitting. You just uh, it's, it's much harder to add it. Um, and Expo will just be this. It'll, it'll focus more and more on native development. And all of the, the web efforts and server efforts will will kind of move through this this new framework, um, and I think that that split will make it a little bit easier for people to kind of grok and understand. Um, like you've probably seen this a bit too, Simon, when when you talk about uh, Expo Router and your content, which is fantastic content, by the way. I, I love your videos; they're really great. Um, but when when you mention like how web works in Expo Router, people are like, okay, but I don't know about React Native Web and like having to 
like the, their mind goes to this more native on web place rather mm -hmm. than this web on native place um, or this universal place. So those are the two themes that I think matter the most. The, the native on web um, direction is more niche and it, it, it's kind of interesting, but it doesn't um, lend itself well to the types of applications that people want to use on the web. Um, so for instance, if you think about some really important native primitives like camera, um, those don't work very well on web and they, they don't have to. Like, uh, and they, they don't really have to interact too much with the server. Um, but if you think about more generalized primitives like text, views, uh, images, and um, you combine these together and you think about markdown, uh, markdown is kind of tricky to do on native and rich text editing is tricky to do on native, but they're much easier to do on, on web. So in cases where you're building an app, which is more focused on, on these types of primitives, or at least the majority of routes in your app are focused on these types of primitives, um, a, a web first approach seems to work more reliably. This is all very hand wavy and it will make much more sense when we, um, when we announce it and release it and show it off. Um, but it's, it's extremely exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hyped for what the future holds with, with Expo Router. There's so much in this. Um, <clears throat> I, I, would, I would probably recommend everyone to skip back four minutes and listen to all of this again. <laughs> <I definitely laughs> would have to. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. There's, there's, um, there's a lot to cover. <laughs> I mean, th this just shows that you're really as well super excited about this stuff, which is a like a good uh, foundation for everything you, that you do. So to, to recap it, when Expo Router hits, hits version 4, at the same time, you're going to rebrand it in, let, let's call it Evan Router version 1. Okay? <laughs> for, for now, this is like the working name. It's Evan Router, just like 10 stay. Um, so at that point, we have we have Evan Router, which enables us to use file-based routing. We can do universal applications. And at the same time, we have Expo Core, which is focused like on, on the core SDKs of native. If I now want to build a universal app, I would, of course, go with Evan Router in my app. If I, at that point, only want to build a React Native iOS and Android app, would I still add Evan Router because I get like file-based routing, or is this then like a, like a problem? Yeah, yeah you have uh, you have two options at that point. You have um, this new system, or you could just use Expo directly. Um, both options totally valid. So with Expo directly, you know, if there are opinions with this new solution that you aren't a fan of or you feel like you don't need, then you don't have to drop Expo altogether. So you can you can still use Expo, you can use continuous native generation, pre-build, EAS build, all of that goodness. Um, and like basically what I'm trying to say here is that you, you aren't locked into any of, any of what we're building now. Uh, everything previously is still highly focused on. Even the structure of how we work on this, um, Expo Router is, is developed by my team, which is a team of four, and we also maintain Uh, Expo CLI and all of the other dev tools at Expo. Um, and then everyone else at Expo works on the native platform. So native is still very much um, our top priority. Mobile development is something we're extremely passionate about. Um, in the, this new framework, um, it, it just introduces an, an alternative entry point into that world. Um, but still will highly catered towards mobile application development. So at that point, I could still use just React Navigation or just Evan Router. It, it doesn't matter. Expo still gives me all the freedom in the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, that's that's good to know. I mean, you, you've made the mistake in the past where we had like the eject command. <laughs> We're still laughing about this. So uh, I think it's good that you're not locking in people anymore. And we we're all trying to... Uh, help people learn more about this. And by the way, we, we talked quickly about free build and eject before this. Mm -hmm. Did you ever think about having like an alias for if people still run expo eject? Could it just like show a message of, hey, you should use pre build? It's not called eject anymore. Yeah. So technically, that does exist inside of the um, the global CLI. So there used to be this giant global CLI which had a bunch of um, You know, what is, we split this up into the local CLI and EAS CLI, but it used to be one giant mm. CLI. And this is kind of a pain because if we had to change something related to the services, then we would do a global update. And for a while, people would have this experience where they would you know, run Expo Start and it would be like, there's a new version of the CLI. Mm. And you would update it even though it had nothing to do with your project. So 
yeah, I, we we rewrote the explicitly from the ground up, and when we did that, we we dropped um, all the aliases and just kind of all the cruft and and moved forward with this new direction. And to be fair, with eject, that wasn't really a conscious um, decision or feature that we added. It was more the absence of a feature. Like eject just kind of dropped some extra code into your project, but it wasn't like that was a a central part of the workflow. Whereas mm. pre-build is a very conscious and carefully crafted part of the workflow where it's like everything is then built on top of pre-build. Um, so yeah, it, fundamentally different. And what I mean by that is it's actually very easy, I think, for a lot of people to make that same mistake inadvertently. It's really it's um, a function of how popular something gets when you aren't looking at it. Um, so for instance, <laughs> Expo Web is actually very similar to this because I, I built the first version of Expo Web experimentally and then I went away to build pre-build and EAS build with, with the rest of the team. And during that time, this concept of Expo Web and using file-based routing to try and share code with the tools like Salido uh, really gained a lot of traction and it really picked up. And so kind of while we weren't looking at it, this became a really big pain point. Um, so now we're circling back around and fixing with Expo Router. Um, it wasn't as big a pain point as eject, but it, it's it's a similar phenomenon that can happen all the time. Um, this might happen like maybe with you, Sam, and maybe like one of your videos, people it gains a cult following, and people are like, "We really love this one video and like this particular style." And it's like, and then they start to resent you because you don't make more videos like that. And then you circle back around, and you're like, "Oh, okay, I didn't realize. Like, I guess I'll do that now." I have one video which is doing fantastic over the last couple of weeks or actually by this time month. The problem is <laughs> it's not really the type of video I usually do. It's it's a video where I talk about the process of using AI to generate an app. Mm. And I, I maybe have used like a clickbaity title, like how to yeah. use AI to build your app. And <laughs> everyone wants to build an app with AI without having any kind of software development skills. And this video... It's just going crazy. I don't know the numbers right now. It's like it's probably already half a million views at this point. I don't know, uh, but it's not really like about app development or stuff. And yeah. It's just yeah, it's it's just going crazy, and I don't really want to do it. And I get comments all the time. Oh, this is like bad, and he's not showing us how to build stuff. And I'm like, I have like 500 other tutorials, and this is like the worst video you're coming to my channel. But anyway, uh, enough of the rent. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really important <laughs> to figure out how to like. Uh, change the the tires on the moving bus, so to speak, and like align yes. your incentives such that the, you know your most popular stuff is also the things you're most passionate about, but then also the things that work for your business long term and and can fundamentally keep keep things self sustaining. Exactly, exactly. Um, I, I'm usually pretty good at transitions. I don't have a good transition right now, <laughs> but I want to I want to come back to what you said before about Expo Web. Um, so yeah, there's there are a lot of concepts about having like a mono repository with Expo and Next.js application together with Solito and code sharing. And people say, yeah, we get the best of both platforms. We get the best of native and we get the best of web with Next.js. With Expo web, it's a different picture. We can simplify things. Uh, but as you said, people don't really like this native on, on web stuff. For example, a good example is on, on native, you have a tab bar at the bottom. I mm -hmm. don't want to have that on the web. It looks horrible. It just doesn't feel web-like. At the same time, I don't have hover elements. Um, mm -hmm. I don't have like these basic things I come to expect from the web usually. So how is Expo Web and Expo Router at the same time improving on this and making it a reality that... React Native for web doesn't suck anymore. Yeah, so yeah, fantastic question. Um, the goal is is really to focus less on React Native for web, and even um, Nick Gallagher, who made React Native for web, ha it, we're, we're very aligned on this directionally. Where um, React Native for web is very interesting if you want to take your native app and run it very close to verbatim, but only the parts that work on web and often that is not like the right way to think about building because a native app is the, the native primitives are things that just often don't work on web so more often than not the majority of what you built um will just kind of be like shimmed out whereas the opposite is true for the web where if you build a really powerful website like think chat gpt and you know, you're using all these primitives you're still delivering a lot of value 
you can take a lot of chat GPT and run that on native and then improve that experience by adding more native primitives around that. But the, the fundamental idea is built within the, um, the bounds of what's possible on the web. So the, the direction of Expo Router, especially when we get to V4, will be more of this like focus on the primitives that work everywhere and the things that are based on specification and um, and, and delivering content driven value that's connected to users. Um, take that and apply that everywhere and then give you the ability to just really um, smoothly improve the, the quality of the application by adding native on top of that in different places. So for instance, maybe you literally made ChatGPT um, as a, a website and you, you run that on native and now you have you know native scrolling performance, you can add haptics, you can add um, you know better keyboard handling, you can add gestures in places. Um, that, that is a much smoother flow than attempting to shim out those gestures and shim out those uh, haptics and shim out the keyboard handling on, on web. Um, so for certain types of apps, this is important. For other types, um, it doesn't apply at all. And I think that division is really important for people to be aware of. It's not a silver bullet. This does not apply to everything. But in, in terms of code, how, how would this look like? For your example, on the web, I would have all my diff elements, my spans, my H1 text. And on, on the native side of React Native, I have my scroll view, I have my view, I have my text element. Do yeah. you at some point like these two worlds converge or would we still have like, if platform is web, okay, it's cool. We can use diff elements because Expo Router enables us. And if platform is iOS, um, then I can use these, these native primitives. How can we like make these come closer together? Yeah. So I've, I've, I've definitely uh, spoken uh, to a lot of details of what's coming up. The, the particular API I think is where things start to get a little, um, Could start to get into spoilers, um, but there, the there will be a a potentially a new syntax or convention which enables better migration. There will be um, better better integration with styling, which we already have today in the form of native wind. Native wind is mm -hmm. an incredible primitive for this. Um, in fact, a lot of people. They, they asked me about like when we'll have CSS on native and native wind actually delivered on a lot of that. And um, you, you can you just talk to talk to Mark Lowler who, who made this tool and, um, and get a better sense for I how will, this I works. Will. <laughs> um, but the, yeah, there are parts of CSS that don't work on native or at least they, they don't currently work on native. And the CSS language format doesn't really give us a lot of handles to express what those parts are. So for instance, if you have cascading, then we would need, like CSS needs to be kind of, like it's usage dependent to determine how cascading is used, right? For instance, if I have like class declaration over here with color inside of it and another class declaration over here with color inside of it, there's no handle for us to like add squiggly lines and be like this, you know, cascading mm -hmm. won't work um, because it's dependent on how you use those class names. Um, so the way native wind works behind the scenes is it is actually parsing CSS into native styles. Like that is happening. You could write CSS and parse it, but the ergonomics would be just too confusing. Too many things wouldn't work correctly. Mm -hmm. So when you combine it with a tool that is more opinionated and already has a lot of these same principles in mind, like um, tailwind, then we have that handle and we are able to express, okay, these styles work. These styles don't work. Cascading, is not allowed in many cases by Tailwind. Certain cascading is allowed, but it's more reasonable cascading like color for text or font size and font. A lot of text things are fine with cascading, but cascading like max width all the way up and down the tree is not an amazing um, setting at all. Um, so Native Wind is a great example of, of how some of this migration already exists and how this web first thinking works. It does give you these handles into um, pseudo classes, pseudo selectors. Um, it's also really great because with V2, we added static rendering, which means you do have hydration errors as a capability because um, your code that you are running on native and in the client on web um, also runs in node and is executed there. And traditionally, if you wanted to do something like um, on hover, actually on hover is not a great example, but um, uh, appearance is a pretty good example where things are dark mode or light mode. Um, you would change that dynamically. 
um, and that would create a hydration error because if the first load is in a, a dark mode themed browser and it was rendered against a, a light mode themed node environment, then there's going to be a mismatch in styling. Um, so you need some way to declare dynamic styles and native one gives you that handle. That was a really big missing piece in the, in the styling story. Um, and that is why we also aren't super tied to tailwind. Like we, we really care about this principle of parsing the CSS, delivering some sort of warning or ergonomic to users about what's going on. And then the ability to have dynamic styles expressed uh, declaratively. Like those are the principles that we care about with, um, with these tooling. Uh, th with our styling. Um, so you could apply that to any styling solution. I just want to make that because we talk about native wind and then people are like, you guys really love tailwind. And it's like, mostly we, we love these principles and tailwind is currently the best way for us to deliver on those. Um, I mean, I mean, Mark was also working on, on native wind before he joined Expo. So it's not like uh, Expo decided that tailwind is the best thing on earth. Expo just probably wanted to support Mark and then brought him on the team and he continues to work on native. And as far as I know, I should have, should have had a recording with him last week, uh, but we had to postpone it. So, uh, yeah, for people listening, great, it's still yeah. upcoming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mark, uh, Mark and I work together very closely. Um, he's, uh, he's on my team. We, I mean, we found him over Twitter. I think he kind of found us and we, <laughs> he spoke with Brent and then Brent was like, you got to talk to Evan like now. Like, <laughs> and then we talked, Brent's like, he's like, Evan, this guy, Mark is about to te like text you. And he's got, he's saying all the same crazy stuff that you're saying about like how, how app development should work. And then we, we hop on a call and then I was like, yeah, this is, this is great. We should, um, we should work together. So yeah, he's fantastic. And uh, yeah, <laughs> people should give him a follow if they haven't. He's an incredible app developer. And, and Definitely, and I'm I'm so looking forward to talking with him about his concepts of styling and and a lot more beyond just native wind and what's going on. So um, yeah, we're running a bit out out of time, but I want to still talk about two more things. So I heard that there's a lot going on for V4. Um, you're kind of dancing around this year. Mm -hmm. uh, my last question about uh, some mm -hmm. some converging components. So I expect that something cool will happen. Uh, we will just leave it here. I think you said something about we're going to see the next major update around May. That's like your timeline for V4 or uh, yeah, what's, so what's the broader 51, picture? 51, it'll, it'll come at least the, the, there'll probably be likely a beta with 51. If the stable mm -hmm. release comes out by 51, people should check on my team's health and just like our individual well-being. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, it's already like it, it would be very difficult to get a beta out by May, um, it, but that that's what we are hoping that we can do, or at least present something. Uh, maybe we'll roll out some of the elements, some of the early pieces that that can be landed, and maybe we'll postpone it to 52. Um, but I'm, I mean, your timeline has been incredible. Like only the thing that happened last year and now V3 uh, and now I'm saying uh, V4 in May. I think you could also like just say summer or something and everyone would be super excited about it. Yeah, API routes was hard to build. <laughs> it's <is> difficult <laughs> to deliver on and, and so is static rendering. But, um, you know, we've done a, I'm really impressed with the team and really grateful for them. Speaking of static rendering, that was actually exactly the word I wanted to hear. Um, your blog, evanbacon.dev, is, as far as I know, built with Expo and all the, the goodness, your duck fooding, all the stuff you're building. Mm -hmm. I think your blog is a really great example um, because it's, it's just a good website. I got hover stuff. I got like when I shrink it, I got like a smaller sidebar at some point. I actually get a tab bar at the bottom. Um, what are you using? Like, really speaking, technical and practical, what are the tools you used to, to build Evan Bacon, uh, like styling libraries? How did you get hover effects and animations going on? What, what's the tech stack like? Yeah, great question. Uh, so this is all public on my, my GitHub um, under Evan Bacon slash Evan Bacon .dev. And it is, the tech stack is Expo Router. It uses this source app directory. Um, and then it uses Tailwind for styling. It's using XRouter v3. So there are some API routes in there that we use for generating like an OG image for blog posts that don't have an OG image. Um, so yeah, it's just really um, all of the, the latest possible things. There's also some goodies in there. Like um, there's a script which uh, attempts to generate sitemaps um, automatically. So whenever I publish, a sitemap is generated and added to the public folder. 
Um, but it also is a reflection of some of the shortcomings of Expo Router v3 and things that we plan to fix with v4. So there are some, some weirdnesses around hydration that you can observe. Um, and they're like, I, I don't want to list out exactly what all the issues are, but <laughs> if you are a, um, if you are concerned that you have an issue with Expo Router and you go to my website, you see the same issue, um, that is a, consider that a confirmation that th that is an issue. Um, I, I believe really heavily in, in it, that people should dog food their stuff uh, a lot, like all the time. <laughs> like uh, if, if I don't use Expo Router, like why, why should you? Like if I'm also not interested mm -hmm. in it, if I don't think it's good, then like what, what is... Um, and I think that applies to lots of different things. Um, so, I think it's a it's a great example of of Expo Router of different functionalities of of static rendering of API routes. So I just looked through the code. Um, yeah, there are a few sharp edges here and there. People report it all the time, um, especially I think with with grouping uh, mm -hmm. files with layouts. And um, just today, I had a problem with like a nested layout. I had a tab bar within. I had a nested stack. And I use like the iOS large titles and I wanted to go to a details page. But if I included that details page exactly at that point, I get the cool header transition of a stack. But on that details page, I didn't want to have a tab bar. So technically, I would usually pull it up at the top level above the tabs. Mm -hmm. However, then you lose the cool stuff of like being in one stack layout. So it pushes to kind of a different stack. Um, so yeah, this is mm. probably a, an edge case scenario. And I can... Also yeah. Share some <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd be interested in seeing that. I, I do think that they're so like it is built on React navigation, and navigation is just so difficult in native that there were some some opinions in React navigation to try and make things easier, uh, where the navigation primitives and the routing are are really closely knit together. And I think now with Expo Router and this uh, ability to have the routing just baked into the file system you could maybe separate those out a bit more and just use the views and the components that make up the, the navigation on their own and then kind of couple them to the routing which exists globally. And this is a bit closer to how things work on the web. So for an example, you know, like one, one thing that I would maybe, I'm on the fence about, would maybe rename tabs and stack and drawer to native tabs, native stack and native drawer so that people feel less compelled to use them on the web. Mm -hmm. And then also with tabs, tabs in particular, I would love to have a headless UI version of tabs where you have to manually add each one of the tab buttons yourself as JS like components. And then you also manually add where the, the, like the content goes, you know, the, the slot effectively. Um, in this way, because right now there's these little workarounds which are kind of artifacts of React Navigation, how it works where people will be like, how do you hide a tab bar? And you have to do exactly. some weird this things. Exactly, this is like a, a very common question you see, and there's no good solution. Like yeah. hiding it, it gives a flicker effect, and it just doesn't look right. Right, and I think it's it's a lot more obvious when you've manually added it with um, components, kind of like Radix type APIs. It's like, okay, if I want to hide this, I just need to stop rendering the tab bar. Or if I want to change the order of the tabs, I need to just change the order at which the tabs are you know, rendered. Um, so that is something that I, I'd like for us to work on. Um, it's not, it's not blocked on us. So, for instance, in the the my portfolio, I actually have an implementation of this. There is a custom um, headless tab bar, and um, so people can implement this in in user space today. Um, it's just like uh, it would be nice if in the future Expo Router provided this as a default, so that you know it would kind of get out of people's way. Um, but you know, right now the, the priority is like un, unblocking the more difficult use case. Like people will come to me, the you know, consultants, a lot of agencies actually who have, who have clients and they've, they've convinced those clients, Hey, you should have cross platform. We can deliver on that really well. And we can build something that works really great across iOS and Android. And then they do that. And then, um, you know, the clients will be like, that was awesome. You know, I love that we're saving all this money. And then they're like, how can we do this with the website as well? And so I, I do have a list of you know, really important features that are blocking people from being able to fully switch over their production you know, use case website, which has 
it, like money coming in. It has a lot of you know, legacy cases that it needs to handle. And we are aware of what those are. And so our priority is to really nail those, those features and functions um, before working more on like the quality of life features and functionality. Which is, yeah, like, I think people with like PS config paths, for instance, like we built in first class aliases, they see that as a quality of life thing. That's actually really mm -hmm. important, especially for the use case you just mentioned, where you rearrange or you move layouts and you want to like move them up and down. It's, it's a pain to do that when you have to like go in and readjust the dot dot slash dot dot slash. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, aliases is an important feature for, for that exact reason. Um, w without noticing, you gave me the, the perfect transition again to the last section too. You said some clients, they love React Native for iOS and Android, and they now want to switch their website, which makes me wonder, and this was the topic of one of my last videos, could Expo replace Next.js? This is a, a spicy take I um, had because you're bringing in API routes. You're kind of doing everything universal. I mean, of course, Next has a lot of other things right now, but it kind of looks like you're moving into this direction. I also picked up this one quote from uh, your post about Metro, where you said, and this comes back to what I initially said, the choice to use Metro for all platforms was driven by our mission to create a fully universal React framework. And that kind of sounded in my ears like a little, like we're taking on Next.js, we're building a fully universal React framework. Was that ever something you considered? Do you feel like Expo could, would compete with Next.js or for sell in that case? Or um, like, is this completely off the charts? Yeah, it's a really interesting question. A lot of interesting observations in there. <laughs> um, I, I think I need to be more it, it's, careful it, it's about a, how I, it's how, a careful I frame, territory. <laughs> how I frame like what we're putting out. Um, but th this new framework, the idea is to create kind of like the first principles React framework, where the only limit of what you can build is like the physical limit of the device in your hand. It's not the limit of the browser vendors or of you know, like what was shipped in Expo Go. It's like you, you can start with the, the best practices the fastest way possible, use all the, the best tooling, and... Um, And then as you need, you can just add what, whatever is required to make it the best possible experience. And, and that is the, the goal of Expo Router. Um, from a business perspective, the, the idea is to you know, it, like, just have more people building apps with Expo. Um, and our, our goal is still very much like, to deliver on this, this native story. Um, and, and a lot of internet consumption, like the majority of internet consumption, it comes from mobile devices. And the majority of internet consumption on mobile devices comes from apps. Like 90% of time spent in a native or on a native device is in an app. Um, so, and I think web frameworks are very targeted at the, the desktop platform, the desktop form factor, and, and how these things work together. Um, which is why things like hover states, like you mentioned earlier, have been kind of mm. less of a priority on native, and they, they're obviously a given on web first frameworks. Um, in terms of, of competing, you know, I think there is, uh, I actually tweeted this yesterday, the, the, the goal is to unlock new types of mobile experiences. You know, like imagine universal linking just built in, baked in by default for everyone. And instead of saying, here's my new app, um, download it from the app store, you could say like, here is a link to what I'm building and you can just go right into it and you can see the relevant content and you can experience the best possible you know, thing that you can experience. The Apple Store app is kind of a funny example of this because it could be a website, except for the part where you're, when you buy a Vision Pro, you scan your face using the front face and like that's not possible in a in a reasonable way in in web browsers or a reliable way. Um, and so imagine being able to build that experience and not being like, okay, we we only have a website, we have to like start from scratch in order to get to this place where you could do like a face scanning thing. You can just be like, you know, no big deal we will deploy an app version of this site and we will we'll have the native views required to make it as, as snappy and as snazzy as possible with um, you know, face scanning to, to measure your face. So um, that, that is really thinking in terms of first principles, like how do we solve this problem using the best technology and not being limited by um, the, the platform that we chose to specialize in when we were like kids or something. Um, <laughs> And so, so that's the goal. And I can see how maybe these trajectories 
have this kind of overlap uh, and in, uh, for a glimpse of time, it will look very much like competition, but um, our, our goal is really to grow the pie. We're thinking very, you know, in terms of positive sum, I think there's, there's room for lots of different tools. There's, there's lots of different types of websites to build. And if I were next, I'd be more worried about like Astro, like Astro is a fantastic <laughs> way to build a oh, website. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know yeah, I mean, lots of people moving to that. It's just great. Like, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, people also said like, okay, if Expo is going to API routes and, and static rendering, at some point they're going to introduce some kind of hosting, probably for my websites or my API endpoints, which could like be part of your business, which is Vercel also doing. But um, yeah, I don't know. Who knows? Well, lots of lots of businesses hosting. Um, a lot of what <laughs> how Amazon makes their money is is hosting. Um, we aren't planning on setting up computers in the desert anytime soon. <laughs> not, um, maybe for you know iOS builds that that could be interesting. Speed speed things up more. Um, but yeah, our priority. It, it's also important to note we do have a host today, and it's a very successful host with OTA updates. Um, the, this it hosts you know hundreds of millions of people um, all all across the world, and it's it's got really great caching built in, so you, you don't even notice how well it works all the time. Um, so really it would be a, maybe an expression of expanding that hosting out to support more capabilities, um, like for instance, bundle splitting on native or static hosted assets or dynamic functions. Um, yeah, I, I just don't, uh, I think the scope of Expo is, is very different from the, the scope of um, some of these other web first platforms. And then I also think that their priority is not native or mobile um, for, for valid reasons. Like with sure. Expo, you know, like on, in the native space, it's, it's difficult. It's, there's, um, the, the rules aren't very consistent. Regulators have had to get involved to, to help people compete in the native space. And, um, you know, and there's a bit of a battle of attrition involved. Like um, we were constantly having to, to battle with, various platform vendors we do a lot of this mm -hmm. so that our, our developers don't have to um, but it, it does change how you you know like what your priorities are and what you what you focus on yeah i, I think expo is in in overall just in a great position because you are probably the best solution to build native apps with react native and if you can expand in a legit way to the web um I think this is going to attract a lot of people who are scared of React Native for the web for various reasons. And I agree, it's just growing the pie. Um, it's also, it's easy to forget that the web is not Vercel and Next.js. Like if we live on Twitter in this bubble, it feels like everyone today is using Next.js. Everyone, everywhere, every, it's like the coolest thing. But then you look at like, Ruby on Rails and, and Laravel and PHP, like the whole web still using WordPress. Yeah, WordPress. We're yeah. talking about like nuances and uh, tiny fractions of, of that whole pie. So it will be I the best cross platform solution for web by like hands down. Um, if the alternative is rendering to a canvas, this is like going to be way <laughs> better than that. They're, they're, you'll like have semantic HTML, you'll be able to search for things, it'll be bundle split, it'll be fast. Um, so it, as far as like building a universal app that has a website, this is this will be key. We, we, we're gonna end it here before we drop the F word. We're gonna have an episode without the F word today. We're only <laughs> focused on Expo and React Native. So thank you so much for coming on, Evan. This was a pleasure. I still had a few questions, um, but maybe I can bring you back in the future once sure. V4 hits the stores, and then we can talk about uh, all the ways to build an app with. Expo router or Evan router and uh, different transition strategies, how we can go from React navigation to it and some, some common pitfalls. Until then, again, thank you for taking the time and where can people find more about mm -hmm. what you do and what you're currently working on? Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, on Twitter, I'm uh, at Bacon Bricks. And you just search Evan Bacon. Um, that's the only place I am, really. Uh, but yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is fantastic. Uh, again, really appreciate your content. It's great stuff. Thank you, and, and more to come. And I highly recommend to everyone also checking out evanbacon.dev and the according GitHub repository if you really want to see like how, basically how the future looks. Um, because this is a really great website. It is using Expo Router. It is using API routes and OG images and MDX and everything that you expect from a blog. So thank you for making this public and uh, hope to catch you again in the future. Yeah, thanks so much. Take care. Bye.